This is a video about the new culture course I'm teaching for the third time at KO. And the first two times I taught it, I kept it loose and sloppy and somewhat disorganized deliberately because I didn't know how things would fly with me. I didn't know how things, how things would fly with the students. And I didn't have that ruthless, pure, 100% sense of focus about where the heavy hits were and what parts of people's lives they connected with and how to package and slip them in. Uh, but that was the first two times. Now I've got, uh, apparently, tremendous clarity, the kind that I'm used to when I've got something really good. Um, I uh, had a brainstorm a couple of nights ago and wrote some uh, fractal notes on what has to be in the course and then uh, imagined a, a description to me of what the whole course is about. <laughs> that became a really interesting outline of uh, three or four hundred points. And um, then today at uh, Sataya's new uh, laptop cafe, I uh, wrote that out very carefully into a six-page, uh, 2,000 word, 3,000 word, description of the entire course to use in the first lecture of the course. Um, the approach to culture in me and in the book that will be based on this course and on this course is quite unique in the literature. I've bought maybe 400 books on culture or so and carefully read the key chapters to each over the last five years. And so I really do know what my competition has written and how they're approaching it. And they all are operating within certain cultures of academia and certain cultures of writing, which I eschew, avoid. And um, how do you make money with culture? And how do you lose money with culture? And um, why is culture so powerful that it pushes otherwise smart, powerful people around as if they were toys, makes, makes fools of the chairman of companies and presidents of nations, um, humiliates Harvard grads. How do you, uh, how do you, that's my approach to culture. I'm, I'm really looking at it in that, it, in an existential way, in that it forces itself upon us. Uh, we don't have a choice. We uh, are pushed by overwhelming power and force outside of us to deal with culture, to recognize it and deal with it. And once, for whatever reason, your life gets pushed around and distorted and dislocated enough where you've had to deal with culture, then that sticks with you as a toolkit for noticing culture when others don't and for doing some operations on it that others can't. And that turns into real career power and real leadership power, tremendous power. Uh, it's quite surprising how much power it is. And then you realize that most leaders aren't leading because they can't notice culture and they can't do anything about it, even if they notice it. And that's one reason why they sort of play the James March game of looking leaderly, taking credit for luck, avoiding credit for bad luck, and uh, and then absconding with as much uh, bonus as they can uh, from their uh, fawning little board. Um, and they were trained to do that at world's top ten colleges, where they uh, have psychopath faculty who hire psychopath students and make them more psychopathic and graduate them to go steal from the world. Uh, Eichmann in Jerusalem is the book on that. If And Blesdo's uh, Culture of Professionals is the earlier book on that. Um, so uh, the, the uh, book and the course this fall are beautifully laid out. I mean, just ravishing ideas after ravishing idea after ravishing idea. Maybe... 150, 200 in a row. Um, and so it's going to be a thrilling course, and it's going to be a hell of a book. Now, it's not necessarily going to be a popular book because it breaks ranks with every, with the, all the 400 books that are out there. It just doesn't at all do what they do in their way, at all, at all, at all. It could not be more different than them. It doesn't admire what they admire. It doesn't respect what they respect. And it has... It has ambitions for a thousand times the impact that they have ambitions for. Um, and I've done this stuff. It isn't like I'm writing a book on 
methods that are homework assignments in some class by some guy who uh, couldn't get along in life and so went to graduate school directly from undergraduate school and got a postdoc because he was nerdy and kissed up to professors and now he's 45 years old at a famous university with no brains and no guts and no accomplishments and teaching courses on how to be a psychopath because <laughs> he's just not alive. Uh, you know, wiggling his arms and wiggling tongue and, and not, nothing inside. I'm not that kind of wimp and, uh, I, I've never lusted for that kind of pseudo effectiveness and pseudo life. I've done this stuff that's in the book and it works. And, and then I trained uh, about 300 Japanese and Chinese students of mine in the last 15 years in Japan at Japanese universities and it worked for them as well. And there was a period where I was afraid of this, this cultural relativism that would work in America and in Western or Anglo cultures, but it wouldn't work in other parts of Western culture, like the Germanic parts or the Eastern European parts or the Southern parts, or it wouldn't work in uh, East Asian cultures. And now I found out it works in Japan and China among Japanese and Chinese both. And it's uh, it doesn't work only when it's in my hands. It works secondhand when uh, 200, 300 of my students try it out. So the methods are proven, and they're proven to be globally useful. And uh, uh, so this approach of saying, uh, let's enter culture in a pure sense from how do you make money with it? And how do you lose money with it? And why does it humiliate our best and our brightest and our biggest and most powerful people all the time with ease? And why aren't we getting better at it to avoid that kind of humiliation? Uh, why are we avoiding it so much if it's so powerful? Why do we have all kinds of engineering, design, management standards that don't include any tools at all for handling and noticing culture? What's the culture in us that prevents us admitting the culture is powerful and handling it rather than just letting it be a disaster that ruins our plans? What's going on? That's an important question. And, uh, uh, and then how do you think professionally about culture? Because 90, on a literal basis, 99.99999% of the statements that everyone you know, including yourself, makes about culture every day are completely 100% false. And so we all generate, it's like leadership, we all generate this constant noise using the word, and we're not meaning anything by those words we use. It's just all noise. Sound and fury signifying nothing, in Shakespeare's words. So, uh, amateur thinking about culture gets you these disasters. That's all it buys you. It doesn't get you anywhere. And then everybody self-appoints themselves an expert at culture because they think you can be an expert at culture in some, some sort of shortcut, easier way than you can be an expert in calculus. Well, you know, if you want to be an expert in calculus, you buy six or seven books because there's six different kinds of things that you apply the calculus operation to. And the French have, uh, in Springer Farlag, uh, Bourbaki has the most complicated stuff, uh, that you can apply the calculus familiar operation to. Um, so if you think that, sh that culture is somehow easier than calculus, you're a fool and a dangerous fool and a deluded fool. And uh, I don't want you running any of my enterprises and I don't want to marry you. <laughs> um, uh, because it's no, in no way easier. Uh, uh, I'm not sure that it's harder than calculus, but it's certainly right up there. And uh, if you're not an expert at calculus, then you're certainly not an expert at culture, because calculus is easier to get access to and, and get skills for learning than culture is. There are very few sources of good skills for handling culture around, and uh, 400 books that teach almost nothing. And uh, there's tens of thousands of really good books for the skills of the six levels of calculus.